Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Thank you very much for joining us today on a beautiful day here in Perth. My name is Terry Slevin. My role is as... Uh, come in, don't be shy. Uh, as uh, Education Research Director at Cancer Council Western Australia. We've been doing this Cancer Update series now for more than 20 years and its purpose is to bring people up to date with the latest when it comes to issues to do with cancer. When people sometimes ask what the Cancer Council is really about and to some extent I try and say that it's in a very complex world, a relatively simple notion, and that is that the Cancer Council is a kind of interface between what science knows about cancer and what the community knows about cancer so we can do something about it. And that's why this series that's been running so long, and we've had lectures in this room for 20, more than 20 years, is about one of the ways in which we do that. Uh, so we always get the best people with most up-to-date knowledge in the cancer topic of the day uh, who talk to the people who are keen to hear it. So I'm delighted that you've joined us today. Today we have a special privilege and I'm delighted to have the opportunity to introduce our speaker. Uh, we're fortunate to have the President of the Cancer Council, WA Professor George O, and he'll talk to us about Australia's fastest growing cancer threat and that's liver cancer. Uh, George is going to tell us about uh, how liver cancer has increased in Australia, uh, the causes of the disease, prevention opportunities and research that's being un undertaken certainly here in Western Australia but also elsewhere around the world and what the future holds. George is highly well qualified to talk to us about this today. He's currently a very active researcher at the Harry Perkins Institute for Medical Research uh, and he was just telling me how excited he is that the laboratory is very well serviced rather than doing a lot of the hands-on work of cleaning the, 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 the bottles afterwards. So he's getting a, a bit of help in the lab which is important for a busy man like George. Uh, and the laboratory is on liver disease and carcinogenesis. Uh, George has an extraordinarily long history of work in this area for more than 40 years. He's a senior honorary fellow at the School of Molecular Science and Emeritus Professor in the School of Medicine and Pharmacology at the University of Western Australia, where he's taught and undertaken this kind of research for more than 40 years. Uh, he was chair of our research grants committee at the Cancer Council for eight years and did an enormous power of work uh, in that task as a volunteer. And he's a board member of the Institute for Respiratory Health, a deputy director of the UWA Centre for Cell Therapy and Regenerative Medicine, and is a member of the NHMRC's Translational Research Facility. He's a board member of Cancer Council Australia uh, and sits on the advisory council to Cancer Australia, which is a government agency. Uh, is also Chairman of the Board and President of the Cancer Council in WA. Before George's presentation begins, I'll encourage you to either switch off your mobile phone or turn it to silence, and when I read this, it always reminds me to do that because it gets embarrassing if my phone goes off. Um, and also I'll ask you to take a few moments at the end to fill in the evaluation form that so we can help to uh, do the topics in the future that are of interest to you. The presentation will be about 45 minutes. There will be time for 15 minutes of questions at the end, so if you can hold your questions till, till then, that will help us. But in the meanwhile, I'll invite you to welcome an excellent speaker for today. Please welcome Georgia. So welcome all. A pleasure to be here. I'm very pleased that Terry extended the invitation for me to speak and update you on the situation with liver cancer. So what I will do is um, be as informative as I can be and to put as positive a spin as I can on this very serious condition. So first of all, I'm going to get to, I've got to turn this thing on and change the slide. So I'll give you the outline of my talk. I'll go through the statistics, the risk factors, disease progression to cancer, and reasons for a poor outcome when you have liver cancer. And uh, I will explain why diagnosis and treatment are, uh, have got problems with um, trying to get that going. But I'd like to finish our, off with hope. And the hope is in three examples of research. And I'm very proud that this research is going on in WA and it is being supported by the Cancer Council then what we can do now, and I will take questions at the end of my talk. Now, the statistics, risk factors, disease progression, and reasons for poor outcome are pretty doom and gloom kind of story. And um, the r evidence has been provided by Terry and his crew, and I, I'd like to say that um, if it's doesn't sound so good to you, don't shoot the messenger. 
that's me, um, talk to Terry about. <laughs> so it's passing the buck? Yes, it is. So very recent evidence has come to light that causes a lot of consternation. First of all, cancer, the impact of cancer, let's just see if I can get my pointer going, more than any other group of diseases. We hear so much about cardiovascular disease. Its impact, 15%, and the cancer burden is actually close to one-fifth of the total disease burden. Why? People dying earlier from cancer than from cardiovascular disease. And here's the graph that causes huge concerns. It's rising very rapidly. Second, you will notice the very close tracking between incident rates and mortality rates. I will return to this topic shortly. This data has prob prompted the CEO of Cancer Council Australia, Professor Sancha Aranda, to state that, I'm sorry, that liver cancer death rates have increased sevenfold in the past 50 years, and it's going to go up another 60% between 2012 and 2020. That's predicted. We need a national strategy to prevent liver cancer, to monitor at-risk people. Otherwise, it's going to get into the top five cancers causing disease burden in Australia. So we must do something about this. Here's a bit of information I've taken from the Sydney Morning Herald. And once again, those mortality rates and incident rates. You will see that with liver cancer, because we're so poor at diagnosing and treating it, that it has an incidence and death rate of almost one. To put that into perspective, look at this. For prostate cancer, 0.16. Melanoma, 0.13. Bowel cancer, 0.26. Lung cancer, 0.77. Now the figure for liver cancer is almost one. So what's the, how common is it? In Australia, these figures show us that 1,778 new cases and 1,732 deaths. Look at that, 97.4% new cases and deaths. That's 2013-2014 figures. It'll go over 2,000 new cases and 2,000 deaths in 2018. Western Australia, we have 88 new cases and 72 deaths. So the diagnosis is virtually a death sentence. It's the third leading cause of cancer among, non, among orig, Aboriginal Australians. It's the second cancer mortality amongst Aboriginal men. When I was at a seminar and saw these figures, I was alarmed. In fact, the gap between Aboriginals and non-Aboriginals is not narrowing, it is widening. So we must do something about this if we it's morally wrong for us not to address this. I'm pleased to announce that, in fact, the Cancer Council has taken on a RAP, a Reconciliation Action Plan, to do our bit in this cancer sphere. Aboriginal Australians, three times more likely to be diagnosed with liver cancer, 3.3 times more likely to die from liver cancer, and two times more likely to be hospitalized for liver cancer. So, what is the progress of the progression of this disease? From conditions such as alcoholic liver disease, which are the risk factors, fatty liver, non-alcoholic fatty liver, cystic fibrosis, viral hepatitis, and hemochromatosis, we have a healthy liver that progresses through a stage of inflammation, and it becomes fibrotic, cirrhotic, And then it gives rise 
to liver cancer. The risk factors. Gender. Once again, the men don't fare so well compared with the women. Males more likely to be affected by liver cancer than women. And if you look at the data, you can understand why. Viral hepatitis, chronic infection with Hep B or Hep C, fatty liver disease, obesity, and alcohol. I put a point here to note that alcohol also synergizes with other risks. So the majority of the population would consume alcohol. And for that reason, any of these other factors tied up with alcohol consumption is synergistic. Now, I've had phone calls about what does synergistic mean. It means when you have something that's a risk factor of two and another one of two, it's not two plus two. Well, bad example, two and three. It's not five, it's two times three, and it's six. So it's actually quite serious, this synergistic effect. Viral hepatitis is a major contributor. In most cases, primary liver cancers are attributable to chronic HPV. Liver cancer incidence rates are also highest among immigrants, particularly from countries where HPV and HCV are endemic. So this is another factor that we've got to take into account when we're looking at the Australian population. Only 62%, 62% of patients with chronic HPV are diagnosed, and of, of these, only 6% of those diagnosed are receiving adequate treatment. So it's something that we have to address. And to reduce the risk of developing liver cancer, we need to have better diagnosis, better treatment of HPV patients. This needs to be improved. Risk factor, obesity. Overweight and obesity is classified here together under a parameter called the BMI. And this results 214 and 215. Look at the incident, look, look at the, those percentages. For men, 71%. For women, it's at around 56% in 2014, 2015. That's another factor here. That is, it goes up with age. And liver cancer affects mostly aged people. And the obesity factor is very prominent in this condition. Now, I've been the barman at my tennis club, the Corinthian Park Tennis Club. I don't know well how difficult it is to um, handle this alcohol issue. Um, when I'm the barman, I'm taken to task when I fill the wine glasses up above the standard drink um, indicator. All the people who don't, when I'm the barman, the sales at the bar actually plummet because I only fill the wine glasses up to the standard drink um, indicator. The other thing that I noticed that when I was president of the tennis club, when we were having our annual dinners, people didn't want to come and sit on my table. <laughs> so it is a social issue. Again, it's unfortunate that Western Australia figures very prominently in these figures. Lifetime. Western Australia had the highest proportion of adults who consume more than two standard drinks per day on average, 20.8%. Victoria had the lowest, 156 Single time, again, Western Australia topped the states. Northern Territory slightly higher, but Western Australia had the highest state, 478 of single time of adults who exceed the guideline, and the guideline is deemed by the NHNMRC, of two standard drinks per day, but while New South Wales and Victoria had the lowest. So why is liver cancer such an issue? The diagnosis, when you look at blood values, we do not have a reliable indicator. alpha fetoprotein is a protein that we use to identify liver cancer. It is not reliable because 
we get false positives. It's not reliable because it's not cancer-specific. We also use imaging as a diagnostic tool. And here's an MRI of a patient with a liver cancer. That's the liver. That's the cancer. Now, that's a huge cancer when it's clear. It's not sensitive enough, our imaging, to detect small lesions. It's not always clear to allow a definitive diagnosis. Sometimes the liver is fatty and there is background noise when you do an MRI. And it's late. It's only visible when the cancer is advanced, as such as I show you in this example. So currently, our imaging techniques need vast improvement. How do we make an unequivocal diagnosis? It is really when tumor is huge, but needle biopsies are taken. And this has its associated risk. Bleeding complications occur in one in every hundred samples that are taken. It's not a trivial matter to stick a trocar through your body into your liver and pull out a sample. Now, when you think about using a needle to biopsy, it's only taking a very, very small sample. Hence, it's not representative. It's only a small portion of the liver. The tumor is often missed. Or, when it's not missed, it's so large that you can't miss it. So that is another problem. Treatment. Again, relatively poor outcomes compared to other cancers. One solution is to take the tumor out. You take the tumor out, and you can only do this for tumors less than 5 centimeter diameter. It's a complicated procedure with accompanying risk, and after you take the tumor out, there's a possibility that the cancer will reoccur. Don't forget that the liver will grow. If you've got cancer cells around that tumor that have been shed from the main tumor, you are encouraging those guys to grow again. So recurrence is a problem. The solution, liver transplant. It's an intensive surgery procedure, and there is immune rejection. So the patient then has to go on to um, immune suppression for the rest of their lives, plus donor shortage. So for every 10 people waiting for a liver transplant, one person gets a liver. So our rates of donation also need to be improved. Treatment. I was on the radio, and um, the interviewer was surprised that we only have one, one FDA-approved drug called serafinib, which is a multiple pathways inhibitor. Now, let me explain. Cancer cells become activated, and they use various biological pathways to avoid death, to grow in an uncontrolled fashion, and to metastasize, to go to other parts of your body. They have upregulated all these pathways, and because they avoid being killed, because they've got all these anti-death signals, they are possible targets for us to attack the cancer differentially to our normal tissue. However, if our drugs affect multiple pathways, then they are also likely to ad attack our normal cells. And as a result, there will be side effects. Serafinib so is notorious. It's not very effective. A multi-center European trial shows serafinib versus the placebo an overall survival improvement of three months from 10.7 versus 7.9 months. The drug costs $30,000 per month to administer, so it's very, very expensive. It has side effects. And this is the only drug that we have. So what I want to do is maybe switch tax, because I don't want to end on a somber note. I want to tell you about hope. That is why we have the daffodil as our emblem. 
It's the flower of hope. And the hope that I have is that through research, research supported by the supporters of the Cancer Council of Western Australia with their donations, supports research that we believe can make a difference in the future. What we need to do is to have improved detection. We need greater sensitivity, early detection, and biomarkers now. We have some fantastic instruments that can take a blood sample and tell you what are the 10 to 30,000 components in that blood sample that can be analyzed. We're looking for markers that tell us that this person has got liver cancer. So the search is ongoing. There's also a way of isolating a single cell from your blood to show whether it's cancerous or not. We can now do DNA sequencing, RNA sequencing, on a single cell to characterize it. So better treatment must come from knowledge of liver cancer so that if we know the enemy, we can find ways to be more effective and ways to be more selective. Personalized treatment is now can be afforded based on knowledge of what the cancer patient's genetic profile is versus what the patient's is. So this is the way of the future, and this will give us hope. With your indulgence, I'm going to tell you a very short, three very short stories about research that's ongoing in WA that is as good as that that's going on anywhere else in the world. I'm really proud of the fact that these people have been supported by the Cancer Council. So the Cancer Council has anti-liver cancer initiatives. We provide information and advocacy, and we collect data so that we know what we're talking about, and we educate. You can see here on this... Um, I'm trying to get the... Oops, I'm gone. Sorry. Again. So what I'm going to do is talk about research. But before I do, all these areas of activity at the Cancer Council, and we are advocating, if you can see here, better health, exercise, alcohol consumption, uh, moderate, moderate that. And the research that I wish to talk about is what my laboratory is doing with support from the Cancer Council in the area of diagnosis. The Turnitz Parker Olnick Group at Curtin University are looking at ways, novel ways of treatment. And uh, Professor Peter Liedman, uh, director of the Perkins Institute, is also um, doing some very novel approaches, undertaking novel approaches to treatment of liver cancer. So our work is to try and use a liver stem cell as a diagnostic and a prognostic for liver cancer. I'll very quickly go through what we've done. If I have not explained myself well enough, I'm very happy to take questions at the end. So the stem cell can either give rise to healthy liver and facilitate its growth, but it can also change and become cancer. Which of these pathways it takes depends on how hard we make this liver progenitor cell work. Normally, it's only used in an emergency. But if we insult the liver strongly enough and for long enough, these guys will overwork. That's the hypothesis my laboratory is, work is based on. So if you look at this data, we can show these liver stem cells are present in liver disease of different causality. Immune hepatitis, fatty liver, alcoholic, all the little brown dots you see are these liver stem cells. They are trying to fix the liver up, but there are some bad guys among these, and they are going to give rise to liver cancer. We have done a preliminary study, and we have applied for funding to try and correlate their numbers 
with the disease severity. And this is a short uh, sort of preliminary study that we've done where the donors have come from normal donors for transplant, and we cannot detect these cells. But in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is NAFLD, patients even with HIV, alcoholic liver disease, these numbers of these cells, the percentage of these cells, we call them GCM5 positive cells, actually goes up. So there is a suggestion that this parameter might be very useful as a diagnostic for liver disease. More importantly, we're testing the hypothesis that they may predict whether you're going to get liver cancer or not. So we're going to go back into a retrospective studies and be blinded by the samples that we're given, and then we're going to make a call on whether that patient is going to end up with liver cancer. So here's where the cancer is. And you can see in the margins of the cancer, there are these brown stained cells. And we count them, and we're trying to correlate the numbers with the liver cancer incidence. I switch now to work that Janina Turnitz Parker is doing out at Curtin University, and she is using the liver progenitor cells as a therapeutic target to combat liver cancer. Briefly, as I told you, what these cells do is that they are growing at an uncontrolled rate, and their growth is facilitated by very strong interactions between something called tweak, which is a growth factor, and a receptor. So the receptor is in the cell, the growth factor is in the outside, and it tells this cell grow, grow, grow by inducing all these growth factors inside the cell that signal it to grow. So we know now that tweak signaling through this receptor called FN14 is making these cells grow in an uncontrolled way. What Professor Parker has done is to show that tweak is a mitogen for liver progenitor cells and makes them grow. And she has now shown that if you block this pathway, if you block the tweak signaling pathway, and you can ablate this in mice by using a genetically engineering approach to knock out what we call knock out this gene in mice. If the gene is knocked out in mice, tweak signaling is ablated, and the tumor incident now, after eight months on a cancer cause, a liver cancer causing diet, the normal mice, 92% of them ended up with liver cancer. The FN14, where the signaling pathway is ablated, only 8%. So we know for a fact that this pathway is important for the liver cancer. So we need to find drugs that will block this pathway. I'll finish off with Professor Liedman's work. And he has developed a very novel pathway called microRNA7. MicroRNA7 mimics the, uh, a form of microRNA7 mimic as a potential therapy for liver cancer. And what it does is he's found not the tweak and the FN14 receptor, but the epidermal growth factor receptor. And this is a strategy that has been used in breast cancers. The breast cancers either have too many receptors or the receptors are too active. In the case of liver cancer, the epidermal growth factor receptor is also either abundant or superactive. So the Liedman Laboratory is making these short molecules which are like, a bit like DNA, and they will block the expression of the epidermal growth factor receptor. So they can silence genes. And we find that they, this little bits of microRNA play key roles in all cells, and especially in cancer cells. So now you know the difference between the cancer cell and the normal cell. They make more of these um, microRNAs. So here's his strategy. 
His strategy is that in cancer, there's a loss of this microRNA7 and there's increased epidermal growth factor receptor cancer signal and the cancer progresses. What if we, took a, if we added the microRNA7 back? So the hypothesis, the goal, is to replace the loss microRNA7 and see whether it affects the cancer. So in clinical trials, in brackets, in mice, this is what he does. So you can have the liver cancer cell with excess epidermal growth factor receptor and with the knockout, with the microRNA7 treated liver cancer cell, these growth signaling pathways, which go on control cell growth and metastasis, they are all blocked. The liver cancer cell dies. You block EGFR signaling and downstream pathways are blocked, and these are microRNA7 targets. So how does he show that this effect is effective? Here are the liver tumors present in the control, and there's a buffer-treated um, mouse, and here's the liver cancer that's growing. So what happens here is that you take human liver cancers and you transplant them into mice. And the mice are immunologically deficient so that the human liver cancer can grow in the mouse. Then he treats them with microRNA7, and here is the the buffer, the control, you've got tumors, but tumors are no longer detectable in six of eight mice treated with microRNA7. So here's a, a possible way of treating human liver cancers in humans. Here, they've shown proof of concept that this works in mice. So in summary, the research in WA is directed towards Diagnostics. My lab is trying to use the liver progenitor cell as a marker for liver disease severity and hopefully an early predictor of developing liver cancer. The therapy, I've told you about the turnitz parker Olnick labs at Curtin University, which show that inhibiting the tweak signaling pathway can reduce and or kill liver cancer cells. And the Leadman lab at the Harry Perkins Institute using microRNA7 to block the signaling pathway and it appears to work with human liver cancers that have been transplanted into mice. So in spite of all the doom and gloom, what can we do now before all this research becomes translated and put out into the community? Well, we can probably deliver better diagnostics and better treatments. But the main drivers of liver cancers are lifestyle-based. And therefore, these are preventable. They're preventable now. Moderate your alcohol and caloric consumption. Prevent hepatitis virus infection. Identify and treat those who are affected. There's a lot we can do now. And I would urge all of you present here to talk to family and friends and encourage them to adopt healthier lifestyles in order to act now. So it's important that we are ambassadors of leading a healthy lifestyle because a lot of these, these conditions that give our rise to liver di disease and hence liver cancer are actually preventable. In closing, I would like to acknowledge the people who provided me with information Melissa Ledger and Terry Slevin from the Cancer Council. Anna Nankerville, she's provided me with the data that I presented you from the Australian Institute for Health and Welfare and also Cancer Council Australia. Uh, I'm not a clinician, but the clinicians Andrew Redfern, Leon Adams, and John Olnick have given me the clinical perspectives that I've provided you with today. Professor Peter Liebman for his microRNA7 data and Dr. Yanina turnitz parker for his, her tweak signaling data. I thank you for coming. I thank you for your attention. And I'm very happy to answer questions. Thank you.
That was fabulous. Thank you, George. Now, there is a roving microphone that will be available, and I'm going to ask people to put their hand up so we can capture your questions on the microphone. The reason for that is twofold. One, so everybody can hear your question, which is important. But the second is we're recording this, and the presentation will be available on our website later this week. Uh, and if you uh, ask your question via the microphone, your question will be part of that recording so that other people who weren't able to make it today can learn from George's expertise. So that's the, that's the drum when it comes to questions and we've got plenty of time for them, so please let me know if you have any. Is there any outward bodily signs that you may have uh, liver cancer? Like, uh, does it show up in your eyes? Uh, Certainly, an enlarged liver would be a, would be a sign. Uh, outwardly, um, I, I would imagine abdominal pain would be another indicator that you have got uh, potentially got liver cancer, and then you have these um, blood tests, the alpha fetoprotein tests. If if all the uh, signs match up, then I think uh, the the diagnostic is, is is pretty accurate. However, I again would say that it's fairly late when you've got a bulging. Uh, organ in your in, in, in your body that um, you've gone to a fairly late stage of the disease. Yeah. Two questions, George. Does it show up in your eyes, like with iridology? Oh, I don't know about that. Um, I, I'm looking at Terry. No, I don't know. I don't know whether there's been enough. There has been a, a systematic study looking at that. Um, again, um, the, the problem with uh, trying to deal with this dreaded disease is that when we find it, we find it late. Um, you'd have to do a study where you'd be looking at people and saying, you know, uh, the, the, their eyes and, and, and looking at further down the track when they have liver cancer. Such a study would have uh, people who turn up with the disease as a very small fraction. So it would be very expensive, yeah. Next question. And second question. How long um, until we stop experimenting on mice and put that into people? Um, the mouse studies are necessary because if you want to do a phase one clinical study, uh, you would have to justify the, the phase one study with animal experiments. Very, very difficult. I think one way where research has gone towards are uh, not using mice is using what we call organoids. So in other words, what a lot of people are doing now is taking liver cancer and, make, and making a mini liver comprising of a few hundred thousand cells, be the size of a pinhead, and putting them out into culture, into mini wells, and then treating. That's one of the personalized medicines I was talking about. So if you took the cancer, grew mini liver cancers in micro wells and then treated them with a drug of choice and found one that was very effective, you'd then use it on the patient. So that would go towards not having to grow a tumor in a mouse, but you grow a tumor as a mini organ in the culture dish. Yes. Uh, my question is in relation to the tumor itself. When a tumor is detected and removed, I guess you try to analyze, to investigate what is the tumor made up. Because during your presentation, you mentioned you can do now uh, DNA and RNA uh, sampling on one cell. So what are the molecules or even atoms in a cancer cell that would be different from a normal uh, liver cell uh, because I think we live in an environment where we are exposed uh, day after day to more poisons, to more chemicals. So I think if, if one of those chemicals that we use in, on, on a large scale is the cause of the liver cancer, then it should also show up in the analysis of the cancer cell, of the liver cancer cell. Excellent question. A chemical that we know that causes liver cancer 
is present in a, a, a district in China. It's called aflatoxin. And it grows, or it comes from a mold that grows on the a fungus that grows on the peanuts. That drug actually causes liver cancer by mutating a particular gene in a particular spot, right? So your question is, okay, if we take the cancer out, one of the other problems is often when you take a liver cancer out, it's comprised of subsets of transformed cells, some on their way, some well fully transformed, and others um, really metastatic. They're going to start migrating elsewhere. So the analysis needs not only to look at the average, but to look and get an understanding of the distribution of the populations. We have that technology. So one of the problems with the liver cancer is, is this so-called so heterogeneous. So we need to understand what are the pathways that have gone wrong and not attack this like a shotgun. We need specific bullets to address the differences. More complication. If you to take the t tissue from one patient, it, its, its profile will be different from another patient. We do not even know if the liver cancer arose out of alcohol, out of fatty liver disease, or hepatitis, whether they are different. Yeah, because if we, if we know the cause, you see, then we know probably already what could we do to prevent it happening. But when you don't know the cause and you're just guessing, uh, you won't ever find a way to reduce the death rate with this type of cancer, I think. So perhaps also, I, I think our urban environment, we really need to think strongly how we design in the future our urban environments. With an ever-increasing car population and... Uh, other things where we try to live together close, that is something which is probably also a significant part why we have all sorts of cancers and in the end also makes a significant contribution to liver cancer, I guess, because yep. the pollution well, that is there is just... Your point is well taken. And in the context of liver cancer, if you ate the toxins in the environment, right, that comes in contact with our body. The liver is the organ that detoxifies. But often, these are poor carcinogens. When the liver metabolizes them, they become very active electrophiles that attack our DNA. So the liver is both the generator of the agent and the victim. So in the context of liver, your um, points that you make are even more relevant. So another question here. Yes. Uh, yes, I hope I can pronounce this correctly. I see that you have mentioned HBV and HCV hemochromatosis. Uh, no, so, so HBV, HCV are viruses, hepatitis virus, A, B and C, HCV, but there is a condition called hemochromatosis. Yes. The liver there absorbs too much iron. And iron is bad for you because if you have too much of it, when, when we have too, an iron overload, it goes to the liver. The liver stores the iron as a molecule called ferritin. And when you have too much iron, iron is oxidative. So you have oxidative stress on your liver. So people with hemochromatosis we have actually analyzed that. We were the first people uh, on this planet to report that these liver progenitor cells are present in hemochromatotics. Their liver is turning over rapidly because of the iron killing the hepatocytes, and the liver needs to regenerate. But because this goes on for a long time, they use what I call plan B. They use the liver cells to grow, but they also use the liver stem cells to, grow the, to replace their sick liver. And when you use the stem cells to replace your liver, but you're doing it for the, all of your life, it's likely there's an increased incidence of liver cancer in hemochromatotics. No question about that. And we have seen the progenitor cell in those patients. And is this, this is hereditary? Yes, it is. There's a mutation. There's a mutation. So it can be screened. Right. Um, other ways of lightening it? 
Well, a hemochromatotic actually donates blood. Donates blood. Yep, that would reduce the iron in, in your blood. The other way of doing it is to actually have what we call chelation therapy. You, you take chelators that bind the iron and makes it not available for the liver. That way, the combination of um, being bled as well as taking chelation therapy will reduce the iron levels. Where do you, or how do you do this chelation the, the chelation therapy, uh, the, the, the compound's called desferioxamine. I'm not sure what the clinical name for it is, but um, there, are, there is work ongoing to show how well, how effectively uh, these chelators will reduce the iron levels. So you can monitor your iron by taking blood, monitoring, and then t doing chelation therapy and donating blood. Yes. So don't die laughing, but we have had a discussion here about both of us like eating liver, and you just said that livers detoxify things. So if you have these poor lambs busily de detoxifying who knows what, is eating liver a good idea? <laughs> Cooked liver. So the liver detoxifies um, because it actually has the enzymes to do it. And it, its aim is to convert the toxic metabolites uh, into a form that is water-soluble so that the kidney can excrete it, so it can pass it out through the urine. But some of these metabolites are actually what we call so electrophilic active. They are so highly charged. They are made to be highly charged so that they can dissolve in water. But if they are too electrophilic, depending on what the toxin is, they will actually attack the DNA of the liver cells and mutate it. So perhaps I can indulge myself and tell you that we have taken these liver progenitor cells and we've made them divide lots and lots. Okay? And they become cancerous. They become cancerous. What my lab is trying to do now is distinguish the good guys from the bad guys by having molecular markers. Because I think just to say that they are there is bad for you. It's not right. What we need to say is they are there, but X percent of them are good guys and Y percent are bad guys. And that would be a much more informative diagnostic. Thank you. I understand that uh, taking uh, cholesterol-lowering uh, drugs called statins has an effect on the liver. Can you explain, please? Um, a little bit out of my, my field, but I'm sure that it does have an effect on the liver because it has to be metabolized, right? Um, so once again, when you, when, you, when you take any drug, right, the liver has got to be uh, monitored very carefully. And I think it's also important for me to mention that when we talk about liver damage, uh, a, a Vietnam War veteran called me up and said... Um, since I've returned from, from, from the war, um, I've been having all sorts of tests to get compensation because I feel really t bad. He said, now I can't go down to the pub and have a drink. Uh, I feel sick as a result. But all the tests that I've undergone say I'm normal. I can't get any compensation. And I said, what tests have you been taking? He said, well, well ALTs. These are, this looks at the liver enzyme, and when the liver cell is broken, this ALT spills out into the blood. If you find ALT in the blood, it means your liver cells are damaged. I say, perhaps your liver cells are not damaged. They are just functionally a compromised. So I say, what you should do is take a paracetamol test. Take a dose of paracetamol and monitor how well you can clear it. I receive a $500 check in the mail. Because, he said, voila, my par the paracetamol test came out really poor for me. I cannot metabolize drugs, and I've got my compensation. I sent a check back. <laughs> Thank you very much. What is available to immunize against viral hepatitis B and C? B, there's an, there is immunization, and it's re highly recommended. 
I mean, we, we work on liver cells, and I, I, I've been immunized against hepatitis B, but there is no uh, immunization for C at the moment, but I believe they're working towards a solution. Nevertheless, we have drugs to treat hepatitis B, C patients. So if, you, if there is hepatitis C infection, uh, it should, should be taken care of as soon as possible. Is the outlook for secondary cancer equally as gloomy as for primary cancer, liver cancer? I think there are more options for treating secondary cancers because you know the nature of the beast. And my understanding is that there are quite a number of, well, there's a high percentage of colon cancers that migrate to the liver. So you would treat that colon cancer in the liver as a colon cancer with more drugs that are available. Um, I, I'm supervising a, a surgeon in, at the St. Vincent's uh, Hospital in Melbourne, and he looks at secondary cancers. And the question that we are asking there is, does the secondary cancer also induce the liver progenitor cells? And the answer is yes. So a secondary could become a primary. <laughs> George, what does the research uh, indicate in relation to hereditary factors? Uh, at what greater risk is someone uh, whose parent has experienced cancer? My first question. Okay, so um, in the June issue of a prestigious journal, Cell, they've analysed about 300 hepatocellular carcinomas and they're genetically profiled this to find out what are the important genes. Uh, I, I was very satisfied when I, I saw this article because three genes that we've identified uh, in my liver progenitor cells, when I force them to grow and they become cancerous, right, are mentioned as a top hit. So we know the pathways and the genes that are responsible, right, that, sorry, I should say, that show up in a liver cancer. Whether they are causal is another matter. Right? Whether they're drivers of the carcinogenic process is something that we need to know. So the, gene, the, the genetic profiles is well known. But th there are some unfortunate individuals in our population. For example, if you have lee fraumini syndrome, you already have one of these genes called P53. One of your two copies is already inactivated. When the second one is inactivated, You've got no fail-safe, you know, no plan B. And those patients are prone to liver cancer. The other one that was mentioned was the, hemo the genetic hemochromatosis gene. That causes an overload of iron in the liver of these unfortunate people. And if that condition is not addressed, they will end up with liver cancer. I forgot, I think it's about 12-fold in increased incidence of a hepatocellular carcinoma in those people. So many, many genetic factors are known. And this recent publication in Cell now tells us how to hunt these out. My second question relates to fatty liver cells. What does the research say in relation to highlighted risk for persons having fatty liver? Do you see it as a precursor to a liver cancer? Again, uh, this is very recent research. All we have is that I showed you some data of fatty liver where these liver progenitor cells are present. But for us to make the connection between the increased numbers and liver cancer, we, we are actually just completed the human ethics. It took us 18 months to get access to fatty liver disease biopsy specimens from Sir Charles Gardner Hospital. And we are addressing that question right now. I have a PhD student who's working on this. And you saw some preliminary data that we've got up there. So the idea that the fatty liver disease is causing liver cancer, one mechanism that we're addressing is that the, the, the liver cells there are surrounded by high oxidation, high uh, oxidative stress, react, what we call free radicals present, and they're dying. They are dividing to replace the lost tissue, but they're also calling on plan B which is the liver progenitor cell. And together, this is a recipe for disaster. Yeah. Okay. That was extraordinarily useful, 
presentation, George. Thank you very much. Actually, I had a question in my mind, but somebody asked it for me about you know, liver secondary. So uh, you've done very well with your questions. Congratulations. Um, we also learned that it's all my fault and I'm always wrong, so the rules are the same here as they are at home. So that's working very well. So before I ask you to thank George, I'll offer you a couple of reminders. Firstly, the evaluation forms that you were given on the way in, if you could uh, complete those for us and anything you have suggestions in terms of topics, we'd welcome your feedback. If you want to stay in touch with what we're doing in terms of our Cancer Update series and the other work the Cancer Council does, if you can provide us with an email address, we can keep in touch with you through that mechanism. Um, and, and as I mentioned, we've gone uh, out of our way to ensure that we can capture the presentation uh, on audio, which will be available on our website, um, but also to check out uh, the Cancer Council WA's website for uh, future activities that we're doing in this space. So I'd like to thank you all for coming along today, and I'll ask you to join me again in thanking George for doing an outstanding job. I wish my students at the university asked as many questions after my lectures. <laughs>